start our conversation this morning, I'd now like to invite Professor Tim Sudpomasan, Professor of Practice, Sociology and Political Theory at the University of Sydney to deliver the keynote presentation. Now, Tim's a political theorist and human rights advocate and of course for five years to 2018 was Australia's, uh, human, sorry, Australia's Race Discrimination Commissioner. Please welcome Tim. Well, good morning. Distinguished guests, summit delegates, can I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And to the conference organisers, thank you for giving me the honour of addressing delegates today. This is a significant occasion and though the word is often overused, it's an historic occasion. It's only fitting, I think, to reflect on some of the history around Asian Australian leadership. 20 years ago, Australia was debating the question of the Republic. Among the leading voices of that debate was Jason Yatsen Lee. He was, he was there among the leading voices on the Republican side, a 20-something Australian-born lawyer of Chinese heritage. He was an eloquent and compelling voice, certainly one of the standouts in the 1998 Constitutional Convention at which he was an elected delegate. As Lee put it at that convention, and I quote, I believe that all Australians should be given equal opportunity to attain the honour of being Australia's head of state, all Australians regardless of their ethnic descent. Lee would continue and, and say, that establishing a republic was about forging a national identity within which all Australians can feel a sense of belonging, a sense of fitting in, and a sense that this land is their home. As we all know, the Republic referendum failed. But the aspirations spoken of 20 years ago, giving all Australians an equal opportunity to lead, regardless of ethnic descent, the forging of a national identity that includes all of us remain as relevant as ever. If anything, they've become more urgent. 20 years ago, many of us, and I would include my own 16-year-old self back in 1999, thought we saw in that Republic debate a glimpse of what we thought Australia 20 years on might look like a confident, multicultural nation, but with institutions that reflected that character. Yet, now, in 2019, serious questions linger. Can we seriously claim to be the most successful multicultural society in the world, as our leaders frequently like to boast? What does it say when the leadership of our institutions does not bear the imprint of our multiculturalism? What does this say about the prospects that Australian citizens of Asian and other non-European backgrounds enjoy within our society? And what does this say about Australia and our cherished ideals of the fair go and egalitarianism? In his recent book, the distinguished historian David Walker speaks of us as a stranded nation, as white Australia in an Asian region. Inciting Walker, I'm guilty of some mischief, if not provo provocation. For Walker's analysis was, of course, historical. His focus is on Australia from the late 1930s to the 1970s. But does there not seem, nonetheless, something disturbingly contemporary about the description of his book. I ask, how many of you thought I was describing a book about Australia today, as opposed to Australia of decades ago? Well, this summit is a timely opportunity for us to put cultural diversity and multiculturalism back on the national agenda. In particular, to ask why it is that Australia does so poorly in having ethnic and racial diversity within 
the leadership of its institutions. To Gareth Evans, to Penny Burt, Andrew Parker, and all those at ANU, AsiaLink in the University of Melbourne, PwC, uh, all those who've driven this initiative, I, I think we owe you all a big debt of thanks. And as the press coverage this week has shown, you have succeeded in putting this issue back on the agenda. That's only half the work. Whether change comes, well, that depends in large part on you and on us today and in the future. It depends on the will, the energy, the creativity, the grit, and the fight of Asian Australian leaders and their allies. Let me turn briefly to the evidence on all this, on the so-called bamboo ceiling or cultural ceiling that exists in Australia regarding leadership. When I was Race Discrimination Commissioner, the Australian Human Rights Commission produced two reports on cultural diversity in leadership, our Leading for Change reports of 2016 and 2018. We did this work because Australia does not collect statistics on ethnic and racial diversity. It's one of the few liberal democracies that declines to collect comprehensive data on ethnic and racial diversity. Now, many of you will be familiar with the report's findings, and if you're not, you should be. I'm not just saying that because I, I produce the work. But let me recap. In the 2018 study, we examined the cultural backgrounds of chief executive officers of ASX 200 companies, federal ministers, the heads of federal and state government departments, and the vice chancellors of our universities. We also examined the cultural backgrounds of senior management at the level directly below those chief executives and equivalents. I'm talking here about the group executives of listed companies, elected members of the Commonwealth Parliament, deputy heads of government departments, and deputy vice chancellors of universities. Now, using statistical modelling based on the 2016 census, we estimated that 58% of the population have an Anglo-Celtic background. An estimated 18% of the population have a European background. 21% of the population have a non-European background, with 3% of the population Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander in background. As it's already been referred to numerous times this morning and yesterday, something like 12% of the population has an Asian background. What we found, all of us already knew and continue to know. Our cultural diversity is significantly underrepresented among senior leaders in our organisations and institutions. Of the 2,400 of the most senior posts in Australia that we examined, 75% have an Anglo-Celtic background, 19% have a European background, with just over 5% having either a non-European or Indigenous background. Of this total, just 3% have an Asian background. If you want to describe it in another way, we can say this, about 95% of senior leaders in Australia have an Anglo-Celtic or European background, while non-European and Indigenous backgrounds make up an estimated 24% of the Australian population, such backgrounds account for only 5% of senior leaders. If you want to be specific about chief executives, we can say this, of the 370 odd that we identified in this study, there was just barely enough for a cricket team, for an 11 who had a non-European background. Let's be frank. These are dismal statistics for a society that prides itself on its multiculturalism. If we're not careful, we are at risk, at risk of creating a new class in Australian society, a class of professional Asian Australian coolies in the 21st century a class of well-educated, ostensibly overachieving Asian Australians who may be nonetheless permanently locked out from the ranks of our society's leadership. Now, it's often said that time can solve this underrepresentation. Give it some time, I hear it said. But time alone may not resolve 
a lack of cultural representation. After all, it's already been about half a century since the white Australia policy started being dismantled. It's been about four decades since non-European background migrants began arriving in Australia in significant numbers. For some time now, the children of migrants on average indeed outperform the children of Australian-born parents when it comes to educational and employment outcomes. In what is, by international standards, a relatively mobile society, we should by now be seeing a greater representation of cultural diversity in senior leadership. One set of problems explaining why we're not seeing it, bias and discrimination. These are undoubtedly factors. There's a wide body of research that indicates that those from non-European backgrounds experience more significant barriers relating to discrimination in the workplace. Uh, one much cited study done by the ANU, for example, found that having a Chinese name or a Middle Eastern name can mean that a job seeker may need to apply 68 or, sorry, 68 or 64 percent more times respectively compared to someone with an Anglo name before being invited to interview. A more recent study conducted by my colleagues at the University of Sydney has found that those with a white name are three times more likely to be invited for interview compared to candidates with a Chinese name, although the study found that those with Chinese names who had an anglicised first name doubled their chances of receiving a job interview. Good thing I'm called Tim. <laughs> the way bias and discrimination manifest can be subtle, sometimes even unnoticeable, at least uh, to those without a trained eye. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in this room for frequently being mistaken to be an accountant or someone who works in IT, presumably because of the glasses I wear. But the problems of bias and discrimination can also be reinforced through minority self-selection. As it's frequently said, you can't be what you can't see. Identity matters. The Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, one of the influential theorists of multiculturalism, said, our identities are shaped by recognition and misrecognition. Who we are depends in part on what others see, which can in turn shape how we see ourselves. When it concerns leadership, if some groups do not recognize themselves in their institutions at the highest echelons, they may never seriously entertain ambitions to lead such institutions. They may come to understandable conclusions that the Australian Leadership Club may not be as conducive to diversity as it should be. We are seeing this playing out in a certain way for Asian Australians. Many talented Asian Australian professionals walk away from corporate Australia or from large institutions, choosing instead to go into business for themselves. It is striking that the numerous Asian Australian stories of success in business, for example, have tended to involve founder CEOs rather than CEOs who have steered listed ASX companies. This has been the pattern for those, of, for, for people such as Bing Lee, LJ Hooker, and though it involves an ASX listed company, David and Vicky Teo. My point here is that private enterprise and entrepreneurship rather than institutional life has been the vehicle for leadership. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. To each their own, people should be free to pursue their talents in the way that they, that, that, that they may like. But there can be a cumulative or systemic effect that we don't often account for when we think about such matters. We have an extra barrier, as it's been noted by many others recently too, in light of our contemporary political debates, namely the debate about foreign influence in our institutions uh, may be having a chilling effect on some Australians from Asian backgrounds putting themselves forward for public life. Uh, we must not have a society where Chinese Australians in particular need to work twice or thrice as hard as Australians of other backgrounds to demonstrate their loyalty 
or commitment to this country. That should be presumed. That's a presumption all citizens should enjoy equally. So what must we do? How do we deal with this? Leadership is, of course, key. It's no accident that this is a leadership summit. For chief executives and other senior leaders, it is important for them to take the opportunities to speak about cultural diversity in order to signal to others a commitment to the issue. Put simply, there is strength in senior leaders coming together. This is one reason why, for instance, in late 2016, a number of chief executives in business, government and higher education formed the Leadership Council on Cultural Diversity. The intention being, among other things, to amplify member leaders' individual voices on cultural diversity. We also need to ensure that we nurture emerging leadership. One reason why the, the, the 40 Under 40 Award Initiative launched last night is so crucial to having an impact on cultural diversity. We also need to have authentic leadership. It is true that those who are prepared to advocate for cultural diversity often do so because of their own personal conviction or experience. That's not a bad thing. But we must be careful not to delegate the task of leadership just to those from non-Asian, sorry, from Asian or non-European backgrounds. We need to ensure that all leaders step up. It may be that leaders who have limited experience with cultural diversity may be reluctant to speak out, being mindful of having a lack of lived experience. But that should not be an insuperable obstacle. Having the right pipeline of leadership is equally crucial. We need to have the right kind of leaders advocating and leading from the front. Calibre does matter. This should not be an issue where the self-appointed or self-designated leaders on cultural diversity make the running. We've got to have people who can have an impact in the debate. And without putting too fine a point on it, if there are people who can't advocate and can't have an impact, they should consider stepping aside. We need to have data and targets and accountability. It remains difficult without government legislation to get comprehensive data on cultural diversity in Australia. Unlike gender, where federal legislation compels all companies with 100 or more staff to collect and report on gender equality data, there is no legal obligation today for organisations to collect cultural diversity data. Internationally, this is anomalous. Now, the Americans do it. Other countries we would regard as sister or cousin liberal democracies do it too. For example, in October 2017, the British, then British Prime Minister Theresa May released a race disparity audit which examined the treatment of people of different backgrounds across health, education, employment and the criminal justice system. According to Ms May, the audit data may be uncomfortable, but it will also be regarded as a central resource in the battle to defeat ethnic injustice. Data is needed because it's a prerequisite for considering steps such as targets. Targets, quotas, merit, this is a debate we need to have. And we need to have it because at the moment there is not yet a consensus within those who fight for cultural diversity and more representation uh, about whether targets should be adopted. In the research that ANU commissioned to coincide with this summit, uh, the researchers asked uh, respondents, do you think there should be quotas or targets for Asian Australians in Australian workplaces? You know what the answer was among Asian Australians on this question? 14% agreed there should be quotas. 34% agreed there should be targets. 51% do not think targets should be set for Asian Australians. Now, we can argue the merits of targets. We should argue the merits of targets. But this does raise some interesting questions 
for the appetite of Asian Australians to change or to achieve change on this issue. And I ask to those Asian Australians thinking about this, who will fight for you if you do not fight for yourselves? Do you expect change to come from benevolence or paternalism? How will change come if not through accountability and through hard targets? Of course, targets alone cannot do the job. We also need to have change in cultural attitudes. Let me enumerate four. First, we've got to stop seeing cultural diversity primarily in terms of an instrument of success in Asia. Controversial, perhaps. Now, it may be that getting cultural diversity right within Australia has the effect of us prospering in Asia and reaping the benefits of that in Asia. But that may be as much a byproduct as a matter of design. Second, we must not rest on our laurels and make the case for diversity only in business terms, the so-called business case for diversity. With apologies to the economists in the room, we have perhaps lapsed into thinking strictly economistically about matters which are more properly regarded as social and civic. There should be a civic case for this, and that's important. Third, we must understand that change will not come purely through reason and data alone. As David Hume would say, reason is the slave to the passions. We must win hearts as well as minds. And fourth, we must regard cultural diversity as being twinned to the cause of anti-racism. The two go hand in hand. If you support diversity, you must support anti-racism and rigorously. Otherwise, diversity ends up becoming a mere celebratory exercise, culinary multiculturalism. It loses its muscular character as a policy of citizenship. Advocates for cultural diversity must be robust on this, particularly in light of the rise of nationalist populism, both here and abroad. There is now emerging a dangerous moral equivalence between racism and anti-racism. This must be combated. There cannot be a passive acquiescence to the dilution of multiculturalism into superficial exercises in cultural harmony and community relations. We must not be apologetic about multiculturalism being about citizenship and nation building. Let me conclude with some reflections on two questions. First, what is at stake here? At stake here is the very future of Australian multiculturalism. There are significant changes occurring in our population. Consider the words of the journalist and writer George Megalogenis, who has observed recently that we are seeing a shift in the Australian identity from an Anglo-European one to arguably a Eurasian one. As he puts it, and I quote, 21st century immigration has inverted the relationship between new arrival and host as our ethnic face changes from Anglo-European to Eurasian. The new arrival is younger and better educated than the locally born and typically lands somewhere between the middle and the very top of the income ladder. Two out of every three new arrivals since 2001 have been skilled immigrants. They come primarily from India, England, China, South Africa and the Philippines to work as doctors and nurses, human resources and marketing professionals, business managers, IT specialists and engineers. Think about that. That risk of us creating a class of 21st century professional coolies will become only more acute. Second question. In what spirit must we prosecute our case here? Now, for those of us here who are Asian Australian, it is of course about us, but it's not only about us, and it can't just be about us. 
This is much bigger and larger than us. It is about ensuring that Australia lives up to its promise, that Australia lives up to its very best. We agitate on, on diversity, or at least we should agitate on diversity, not because we are unhappy ingrates and because we do not like this country. Nothing can be further from the truth. If we are exercised by this issue, it's because we're exercised by the status quo, because it diminishes our nation and our promise, because we think so highly of who we are and must be as a nation in the first place. Let me leave you with that. This is an important opportunity for us to build momentum for change, but we must not lose sight of the big picture here. This is a national project and it should be understood as a mission of nation building in the best sense of the word.